Well, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, then let's turn this evening to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15. We'll jump back into this series that we've been in for the past eight weeks now called Rise and Fall, as we look at the story uh, of the book of Samuel in the scripture. And so 1 Samuel, chapter 15, is where we're going to spend the majority of our time this evening. But just a a brief catch-up from where we've been. Those past two week sermons will be up uh, this week, but they're not up yet. And so I'm sorry if you if you watch exclusively online, if you're not part of our church on Sunday mornings, um, I'll, I'll get them up so you can catch up real soon. But a, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the, the king that God had given Israel, and then, which is, is Saul, which literally means asked for. God gave them the king that they asked for. And then last week, we looked at chapter 12, mainly, where where Samuel invites all of God's people together to renew the kingdom, he says. And the question is, well, whose kingdom are we talking about? Saul's kingdom or God's kingdom? And the answer is really both, but with an emphasis on God's kingdom, because he makes it very clear, God makes it very clear through Samuel in that chapter, that even though Israel has asked for a king, he is not abdicating his throne. They are still his people. He is still their God, and he is still ruler over them. And so if you were to make an org chart of Israel in that day, it would be God front and center. He is the CEO. He is the king and then prophet, and then king. So the king and the people are supposed to be listening to the word of God that was coming through the prophets at this time. And so where we would think normally king's on top, they're saying, God says, no, no, I'm on top, and the king over my people needs to be listening to the sound of my voice. All right, so that's where we ended in chapter 12. And then in chapter 13, Saul, um, Saul's son, Jonathan, comes onto the scene. And Jonathan's a great character. We're actually going to look at him more later on in the story of 1 Samuel. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time there tonight. But Saul has 3,000 troops, uh, the best in Israel. And Jonathan takes a thousand of them and he goes in one direction. Saul keeps 2,000 and stays where he's at. And Jonathan defeats the garrison of Philistines at, at Gibeah, which is what Saul was originally supposed to do, but didn't. And so because their garrison was attacked, then the Philistines muster up this gigantic army. I mean, one estimate that I read this week said that it was around 48,000 soldiers. So where Israel has 3,000 soldiers, period, at this time, the, the Philistines came at them with 3,000 chariots, which had two, two men in, in them each, well-armed, as well as 6,000 troops uh, on horseback, and then soldiers uh, as many as the sands on the sea the scripture says and though so then in chapter uh in chapter 13 there we'll just read a little bit of it because there's a key moment here in the scripture so if you remember back in chapter 10 samuel god had, samuel had told saul that he should deal with the philistines there at gibeah which he didn't but his son did eventually and then he was to go to Gilgal and wait for Samuel there so that they could offer sacrifices and then he would tell him what to do next. And so Saul does that. He goes down to Gilgal. And so that's where we pick it up in verse 7. Saul, however, was still at Gilgal and all his troops were gripped with fear. He waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set, but Samuel didn't come to Gilgal and all the troops were deserting him. So Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And then he offered the burnt offering, which he had no right to do. He was not a priest. Samuel was the acting priest in Israel at the time. And so he is way out of his league when it comes to this. And so just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived, of course. And so Saul went out to greet him and Samuel asked, what have you done? What have you done, Samuel? And then Saul answers, look, I saw the troops that were deserting me. I've been waiting on you for a week now, Samuel. Where have you been? Where, where were you a couple of hours ago when I was you know, debating on whether doing this or not? 
But when, when I saw this gigantic army that's gathering at Mishmash, I thought they're going to attack me and the, the soldiers are deserting me. And so he says, I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. I didn't want to, but I, I just had to. And so then Samuel says to Saul in verse 13, you have been foolish. You have not commit, kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel, but now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. So we just three times, in fact, saw this king anointed. And now, in the very next chapter, you see the beginning of the end of the rule of Saul. And in fact, in chapter 15, which is where we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight, we see, from God's perspective at least, the end of Saul's reign. Now, it takes another couple of decades for Saul to actually not be on the throne. Spoiler alert, the last chapter of 1 Samuel, Saul dies. So all that time in between, he's still technically on the throne, but as far as God's concerned, his rule, his reign is over. Now chapter 14, we're not going to spend a lot of time in tonight because it's mainly about Jonathan. And so when we see Jonathan later in the story, we're going to go and pick back up uh, and, and look at chapter 14 as we look more at Jonathan. So then chapter 15. Chapter 15 starts talking about the Amalekites, all right? And so we need to go back and go, who are these Amalekites? Well, they are descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. Uh, Amalek is, is Esau's grandson, all right? So they're distantly related to the Israelites. And here, here's the rundown on them. They're basically a barbaric, evil, sadistic people who have been a thorn in Israel's side for hundreds of years at this point, as well as all the other nations in that area. They're this nomadic or semi-nomadic tribe that was kind of on the outskirts of Israel's territory out in the desert, and, and they were basically marauders. I mean, they were bandits. Think ISIS or the Taliban or Somali pirates in our day, all right? And that, that would be getting close to kind of what these people were like. And so when Israel was first coming out of Egypt, when God had rescued them and they're headed towards the promised land, the Amalekites were actually the first people that attacked Israel. And on the very day that that happened, God said this, write this down on a scroll, Moses, as a reminder and recite it to Joshua. I, the Lord, will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. When I, when I hear write this down, just because um, I love country music, I automatically think of the George Strait song, write this down. Take a little note to remind you, Moses, in case you didn't know that the Amal Amalekites are evil and they're going to have to go, write this down and remember it. And then he repeats it again in Deuteronomy as Moses tells Joshua this. And then now here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God says, it's time to make good on that promise. Look at verse 1. Samuel told Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people Israel. Now, listen to the words of the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies says. I witnessed what the Amalekites did to the Israelites when they opposed them along the way as they were coming out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them. Kill men and women, infants and nursing babies, oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. Now, let's be honest, those words are hard for us to read and comprehend, aren't they? I mean, it would be easy to just keep on reading right now and, and go on in chapter 15, but that would leave a lot of questions unanswered. That sounds, that sounds a lot like genocide, doesn't it? It sounds like, in our day, it sounds kind of like Islamic jihad, right? How do we make sense of God telling Israel to wipe out these people? Is this the God of grace or the God of, of genocide? Well, 
let's let's just back up for just a second and kind of lay the groundwork for talking about this kind of thing, which is from uh, I heard one pastor say this week this this way this week and, and I love it from creation to new creation from beginning to end the Bible reveals a God who is holy and just and good and as God by the way he gets to define what those terms mean because he's God. So when we try to understand hard topics for us to understand like this, the first thing that we have to come at as, as believers is we are coming at this from a place of humility, not accusation, all right? We are not coming at it thinking that God's this evil person because we know better because he has been better than that to us. And so we don't forget the whole of what the Bible teaches about him when we focus in on these few phrases. Uh, another thing that I just want to point out here is that this is a war of God's justice, not of Israel's conquest. See, the, the judgment of the Amalekites here is not Saul's idea. It's not Israel's idea. It's not Samuel's idea. It is God's idea alone. They weren't go, looking to go fight the Amalekites. But rather than just striking these people dead, which he could have done, God chose to use his people as the tool that was in his hand to administer his divine judgment. So, so God, who is sovereign over all, who sees all, who knows all, he, he knows all of it, including all of the suffering and the death and the destruction that these people have been wreaking havoc on the whole world around them. And he's been very gracious to them. He's given them a couple of hundred, 300, 400 years to repent. But the scripture says that the Lord's Spirit doesn't, doesn't deal with man forever. And eventually, he says, enough, enough. Time is up for the Amalekites. Scripture's clear from the beginning to the end about this as well. God will judge every nation one day. Their day was this day. And you think about how, how nations normally go to war. They, they go to war at least partially to enrich themselves, right? That's not always the main reason even, but there's always at least a few people in the background trying to make use of the spoils of war for their own good which is why it's so important to see the specifics of what God is saying to Israel here. Destroy everything. Don't take anything away from this. This is not your battle. It's mine. I'm just telling you to go handle the details. You are not to profit a single penny from this. It was, it was God's judgment using Israel on the Amalekites, which you can say, oh, that's fine and good, but what about these innocent people? What about the, the nursing infants? Well, part of that is the, the way that we as Westerners think about justice versus Eastern thought, and the Bible is an Eastern thought book. I mean, it, it, it's universal, but the, the avenue, the, the the standpoint that it's coming from is this Eastern thought most of the time, which is much more communal rather than individualistic. And both of those are represented in Scripture as aspects, different angles to view God's justice from. And you can see that, and we'll see these both of here real quick. Listen, on the Eastern communal kind of side of justice, we are not lone individuals. As much as we love to think about rugged individualism, what you do affects the people in your community and in your nation and what other people do affects us as well whether for good or for bad i mean you, you see this play out in families if you come down a step from from nations or cities children who were born as drug babies or with fetal alcohol syndrome they didn't do anything to deserve that they didn't do anything different than a baby who was born in a healthy family but they suffer because of their parents' sin. That's just a reality of living in a fallen world. And so for God to take out this entire nation that is nothing but evil, in some ways it's actually a in some ways it's actually a mercy towards them. Because because what would have happened had they 
had they grown up to be good Amalekites? Well, they, they would have followed in their parents' sadistic ways, no doubt. And so God judges them, but even in his judgment, there is mercy. Uh, I'll give you this example just to, just to end this little discussion. It's possible. In fact, I might even say that it's likely that unless something drastically changes, that my children or my grandchildren maybe will have to deal with God's judgment on the United States of America during their lifetime. I mean, you just look around and you see a people that are increasingly evil and evil. Even though my children necessarily or yours didn't cause anything, they didn't, they didn't cause that, they didn't play any part in it. They are not going to be immune to God's judgment over a whole people. They're gonna to have to live with the ramifications of that. Or I hate to even say this, but they might not live through the repercussions of God's judgment on America. And if that happens, God has not done an injustice to them. God deals with nations. He deals with people on a communal level. And yet at the same time, now looking at it from the individualistic side, when my children stand before God one day, they are not going to be judged on America's sins. They're not going to be judged on their family sins. They're not going to be judged on my sins, thank goodness to them. They, they're not going to be judged on anything other than their own lives, their own sin, and what they did with that, and whether they, they surrendered to Christ and let him take the punishment for them, which I pray with all my heart that is true, or if they reject him and take the punishment themselves. But they're judged ultimately, individually, before God. And so we're only seeing one side of the justice in this life. But don't fall for the trap of thinking that this life is all there is. What, what's true there for my children is also true for the Amalekite children. It was actually God's mercy sparing them from becoming what they would have become had they grown up to be good Amalekites. And so with that said, let's go and read some more in 1 Samuel chapter 15. So, so Saul goes and does what the Lord commanded, sort of. Verse 8, Saul and the troops spared Agag and the, rest of, and the best of the sheep and goats and cattle and choice animals, as well as the young rams and the, the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. So they go in, they do the job that God said, like, 85, 90%. But you, 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 know, you, you walk into a palace that has just recently been uh, emptied of people. And you see the stash of gold over in the corner. And you go, boy, my family has really struggled the last few years. It's not been good. I could really use that. And so they basically pillage the Amalekites. Verse 3, God says, do not spare them. Verse 9, Saul and the troops spared, gives the list, and to sum it up, the best of everything else. They were not willing, it says. There's too much good stuff to let it go to waste. And now look at God's response to what happened. Verse 10, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and it has not carried out my instructions. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Now that verse brings up a whole other theological discussion that we don't have a lot of time to dig into tonight, which is how can a God who knows everything, knows what's going to happen, knows the deepest part of people's hearts, how can he regret something? That's kind of that's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around, isn't it? It's a good question. Uh, we don't, like I said, we don't have time to dive into it deep tonight, but let me just say this. You always let Scripture interpret Scripture. You always let the, the clear things that the Scripture say interpret the things that are harder to understand. For instance, later on in verse 29 of chapter 15, Samuel says, Furthermore, the Eternal One of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he is not man who changes his mind. So if both of those things are true, and they are, that God says he regrets 
making Saul king, and he does not change his mind, then we have to go, well, in that case, God's regret must be different than human regret. And also, before we leave this, let me just remind us again that we are reading story, a story where God is the main character, and he is not a character that is just outside of the story with an unchanging will. He is that, but he's also inside the story, and he's explaining his emotions and his feelings to us in human terms that we can understand, including in time that he is not bound by, but he's ex- he's revealing himself in that way. We're talking about a God... I I used the example this morning of parents who you've ever watched your child do something. They don't maybe even realize that you're watching, but they're getting ready to do something that you know that they're not supposed to do, that they know they're not supposed to do, and you know the punishment that's going to come if they do it. And you're watching going, oh, come on, you can do it. Don't, Don't disobey. And then you watch them do it. Now, you knew it was going to happen, but you still feel your heart sink the moment that they touch whatever it was that they weren't going to touch. And that's what God is saying here. In fact, some translations say, I'm grieved. I'm grieved that I made Saul king because he's turned away from following me. And really what's happening here is exactly what God said would happen in chapter 12, is if the Israelites, the people, and their king do not listen to the sound of his voice, then his hand is going to be against them. Uh, Pay attention to that, the sound of his voice, because it, it makes what Samuel's about to say to Saul all the better. So Samuel gets up that next morning after crying out to the Lord all night, And he goes to confront Saul, asks where he is. Turns out Saul's off building a monument to himself because of this great victory that God had given them. And so then Samuel goes and he confronts him. When Samuel came to him, Saul said, May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. And then Samuel replied, Then what is this sound of sheep and goats and cattle I hear? What's that sound of bleeding, of buying, whatever sound goats make? What is that sound, Saul? Well, you did everything the Lord said, huh? Saul was caught red-handed. All those, all those animals have the tags in their ears that say Amalekites. And Saul answered, the troops brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best sheep and goats and cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we destroyed. I love Samuel gets so frustrated here. He says, stop, enough, Samuel, or enough, Saul. I know what you did. I understand what happened, and it is not good. Stop, exclaimed Samuel. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, he replied. Samuel continued, although you once considered yourself unimportant, Haven't you become the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and then sent you on a mission and said, Go and completely destroy the sinful Amalekites. Fight against them until you have annihilated them. So why didn't you obey the Lord? Why did you rush on the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission the Lord gave me. I brought back King Agag of Amalek, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. The troops, they took sheep and goats and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was set aside for destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And then Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And those were some tough words for Saul to hear, as we'll see in a few minutes. 
so application for tonight and we're going to walk through the rest of this chapter as we go but here's the first thing incomplete obedience is complete disobedience let me say that again incomplete obedience is complete disobedience see by taking the best of what the amalekites had not only did saul corrupt god's justice that he had told them to to do against the amalekites he became just like them this king agag he's the leader of this band of violent marauders who pillaged other people with unprovoked attacks and now by his disobedience that's exactly what Saul and the people of Israel have done remember the people asked for a king like the nations including the Amalekites and they got what they asked for literally Saul's name means asked for they got what they asked for and here it is See, when we're talking about obedience to the God of the universe, we're talking about complete obedience. Not partial, not just part of the way, complete obedience. And yet, that is so hard in our own lives. If any point along this way you have felt sorry for Saul, and especially in chapter 13, it's very easy to because everything that Saul did made sense from a worldly perspective. He's been waiting seven days, a week, for Samuel to show up, and he still hasn't. And he still hasn't. He's still waiting. It's 3 o'clock. It's 4 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock. He's going, where is Samuel? I see 50,000 people on the other side of the gorge getting ready to come over here and take out my 2,000 that ends up being about 600 by the end of the week because they're deserting him. He's going, something has got to be done here. Bring the sacrifice. He's a king who is taking command. He's taking leadership. He is making a decision because it is looking really, really bad for the people. From a human perspective, everything that he did made sense. And it's easy to, to sympathize. And to, when Samuel shows up to go, my gosh, that's harsh for what Saul did. He just went ahead and did the sacrifice. But when you remember the hierarchy, God, prophet, king, when it comes to the promises of God, it was the absolute worst thing that Saul could have done. And then from then on, it just keeps on snowballing all the way through the rest of this book Saul's going to spend the last couple the last decade of his life running around the wilderness of Israel trying to hunt down David who was not a threat to him at all because he's so worried because in this chapter the word of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord moves away from Saul because he obeyed the Lord 90%, 85%, 95%. But incomplete obedience is complete disobedience. Did you catch what, what Samuel said there? It's interesting the comparison that he makes between defiance of what God said. Let's read verses 22 and 23 again. Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, he does not. Look, to obey, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. Look at this. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry incomplete obedience is complete disobedience and defiance is like divination we don't use that word a lot but divination is uh, usually some for some sort of dark uh, art where you're trying to look and, and find out what to do by some other means other than god you're you're looking at your horoscope you're getting your palms read you're pulling out the ouija board like a lot of people probably will be this weekend you're you're doing a seance you're you know whatever the case may be 
to try to find some other way of, of understanding what to do. We're trying to get some knowledge or understanding. Uh, I like the way John Piper put it. He says what I just said, that divination is a way to know what to do apart from God's word and his counsel. And that's exactly what disobedience is based on. God says one thing and we say, I think I'll consult another source of knowledge, namely myself, right? He calls it the little wizard of our own wisdom. I'm going to consult with a little wizard of my own wisdom because Samuel says here, God says through Samuel here that rebellion, defiance of his, of his word, of his commands, of the way that he wants you to live your life is exactly the same thing as witchcraft, essentially. Now, I, I assume that most of you, you know, watching this right now, you, pro- you may have a candle lit, but I seriously doubt that you've got, you know, a circle of them and, and you know, a satanic symbol up there or a bale that you're going to worship and you're going to, you know, sacrifice some kittens and, and cut off the heads of some, sh- of some chickens and sacrifice them to the devil tonight. If you are, I'm going to pray for you. You should not do those things. But when we have areas of our life that are off limits to God, where we're following him, we're going to church, we are, maybe you're tithing, you're, you're a part of a faith community that's, that's thriving, and yet you're living with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You're doing all those things, and yet you're you're fudging the numbers on your taxes. You're fudging the numbers at work so that you will get that promotion. You're, you're, whatever the case may be, maybe you're not doing any of that stuff. You're good on all of that, but you are not giving to the Lord's kingdom. You, you find that you'll give your money, but you just can't give the time. Whatever it is, and I'm not going to try to be the Holy Spirit anymore. I'll let him tell you what, what that is for you because he knows you more than I do. I don't even know who's watching, but those areas of our lives, they're essentially the same as witchcraft. It's the same lie of the devil that he told Eve in the garden. You can have the knowledge of good and evil. You can be the one who decides. Nobody should be able to tell you what to eat and not and what not to eat. You're your own person. Be your own person. And God says, it's witchcraft. It's wickedness and it's idolatry. So defiance is like divination. Incomplete obedience is complete disobedience. And here's the last thing that I just want you to see in the story of of Saul and his fall. This series is rise and fall. This would be the beginning of this long, slow slide for for Saul. And in one sense, it's the end because really... Spiritually speaking, it's the end of his kingdom right here. And that is the self-defense. When it comes to repenting, when it comes to confessing, when we're confronted with our sin, self-defense is self-deception or at least leads to self-deception really quickly. You, you notice how much Saul protests what's going, what Samuel's saying, what's going on in this situation? He says, no, 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 no. First of all, he comes up, I've done what the Lord said. Oh, really? You've, done, you've heard the voice of the Lord, but what's that sound that I hear right now, Saul? And he says, oh, well, yeah, we, we took some, but we're going to offer him to the Lord. And he says, stop. No, you want to know what the Lord told me last night? And I was up all night crying to him and, and angry and in prayer while you were building a monument for yourself. Saul, you know what I was doing? You want to know what I heard? And he says, yeah, tell me that I'm stripping the kingdom away from you because you've turned away from me. And he goes, no, 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 stop, wait. We did it for the Lord. We did what the Lord said. We just took a little bit extra. He, he's deceived. He doesn't get it. And that's, the, that's one of the most dangerous things about sin. The sinfulness that causes us to disobey God's command often will make us blind to the fact that we've disobeyed God's command. We're deceived, self-deceived. 
just self-deception or just, you know, kind of filtering out of stuff. It's, it's basically this. It's not knowing something because you don't want to know it. Not knowing because you don't want to know. You ever, you ever known somebody like that? Ever, ever been around somebody like that who you know that they know the truth, but they can't admit it? Maybe they've been caught in a lie and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper, right? Because they can't admit that they were lying about this little thing to begin with. That is our lives in a nutshell. When we try to make excuses, that's literally a lie. I did what the Lord commanded. That's a lie. Oh, well, we did it so that we could sacrifice to the Lord. That's a lie. Well, there's actually more here. He, he goes on to say, I, I'm sorry. I, I've, I've done wrong before the Lord. Please come back so that I can sacrifice to the Lord. And Samuel goes, nope, I will not come back because you have walked away from the Lord and the Lord has stripped the kingdom away from you. Now, why wouldn't God accept his repentance, right? Why wouldn't God? That sounds really good. That sounds really good. And yet, just a few verses later, the next thing that Saul says is, Come, honor me before the people, and they'll all bow and worship the Lord. He's not talking about some repentant sin offering. He's talking about the, the fellowship offering that they would have because they won this great battle. He doesn't want to lose face with the people. He's still worried, even though he may be done with the little monument he was building, he's still worried about building up himself in front of the people. It's not real repentance. Samuel says to Saul, the Lord has torn the kingship of Israel away from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. That's a harsh word. Your neighbor who is a better man than you, Saul. We're going to meet that better man as a little shepherd boy next week in chapter 16. But as we'll see in this book, he's far from perfect. I mean, he is, yes, the great King David, but there are some moments in his life that are decidedly, oh, not so great. In fact, you just think about the, the issue, all of the sin with Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. I mean, by almost anyone's standards, looking at that whole situation, what David did was way worse than what Saul did here. But we're not going by other people's standards. We're going by God's standards. And both of them said the same thing. I have sinned. So why did God accept one's repentance and not the others? Well, one was sincere in it, had the heart that was right in his confession of his sin. Think about what Saul just said in this whole chapter. And then hear the words of David from Psalm 51, after the whole mess with Bathsheba and Uriah. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion it haunts me day and night against you and you alone have i sinned i've done what was evil in your sight you'll be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just oh create in me a clean heart oh god Renew a loyal spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Do you hear the difference? What a difference. One says, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't have done that. Come, come honor me before the people. The other one is down on his face saying, against you and you alone, have I sinned? 
Have mercy on me, O God, not because I deserve it, but because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out my sins. You'll be right in whatever you do to me. Whatever judgment is coming is righteous. I'm just asking that you create a clean heart in me, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Restore to me, God, the joy of my salvation. I remember what it was like, and I want it back again. I want you back again in my life. That's the difference. That's the difference. When we're talking about obeying God part of the way, and when you're confronted with your sin as the Holy Spirit works in you, which reaction are you going to have? Which reaction are you going to have? Are you going to be like Saul, try to, try to blame? Oh, it was the people. It was the people. They, they were doing it. No, you're the king. Oh, it was, we're doing it for God. You, you obey for him, and everything else comes after that. Or are you going to be like David that says, Oh, God, forgive me. Not because I deserve it, but because of your unfailing love. I know that you love me, and I'm so sorry. We didn't read the rest of that passage tonight. You can read it in your Bible there, but Samuel turns back, and he says, Bring Agag here. And he finishes the job that Saul didn't do. He hacked Agag to pieces, it says. Where's your Agag? Because God is asking you, requiring of you and me tonight to hack him to pieces. Today is the day that that part of your life that is not surrendered to him needs to die so that we can be obedient and follow him, not 50%, not 90%, 100% surrender, listening to his voice and being able to hear it because there's no more sound of animals in the background. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray right now by the power of your spirit for all those who are listening right now that you would reveal to them as you revealed to me the agags in our life, the sheep that are the, the reminders of these areas where we're not following you. And God, I pray that this would be the night that they die. By your grace, by your spirit, give us the courage and the wisdom. God, search us, know our hearts. See if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. And we commit to you again tonight, October the 30th of 2022, that we are going to follow you 100%. You tell us where to go and we will go. You tell us what to do and we will do it. You tell us what not to do, and we won't do it. You tell us what to say, and we'll say it. You tell us what to give, and we'll give it. You have control over us. We are listening for your voice. So speak, O oh Lord, because your servants are listening. For the glory of your name, amen.